Hey everybody, welcome back to ChallengeYourself.blog. I want to go over a few things uh, that I've discovered as I've been using my new 3D printer. Uh, these things will hopefully save you some pain and we're getting started right now. So in this video, I'm going to go over the process I use uh, when I'm using my new 3D printer. It's an Ender 3. One of the things I know about you, uh, if you've bought a 3D printer, that you are excited, you want to dive right into it, you want to roll your sleeves up and get right to it. One of the great things about uh, the setup that I have is all of the software I'm using is free. Uh, I only have to, I only had to purchase the hardware and consumables, uh, namely the filament and you know, a handful of tools. Uh, if you're watching this and you have any recommendations, I, I'm completely open. Uh, to anything you have to you know suggest recommend so please leave comments below I know uh, I've had a ton of support you know coming from the Facebook and uh, Reddit community so I want to thank uh, you know anybody that's given me some advice on this stuff um, and if you're new to 3d printing or thinking about buying one and have zero experience I've gone through some uh, interesting discoveries and I, I think I'm going to have some uh, pain-saving advice uh, throughout this video. Uh, also, I have a few links uh, that I'm going to list below uh, in the description. It'll offer some of the other uh, YouTube channels that I've subscribed to that I've used as reference. Uh, when I say run into a modeling issue or I need to you know convert a file or whatnot, there's, uh, there's a lot to this process. So, um, you know, hang in there. And through this creative process, I, I hope that maybe this video, you know, brings some light to a few things that uh, a, a brand new person uh, coming into the 3D printing world may take for granted. Um, you know, if you run into an issue, the other content providers, um, they gear their videos to doing a specific task. But if you have something in mind um, that you're trying to do, it those videos may not cover uh, exactly what you're looking for and then you have to hunt for things. So hopefully uh, in this video, I'll cover a few things that maybe those videos don't, uh, you know, don't cover. So overall, I've been very happy with my Ender 3 printer. Uh, I'm using PLA filament for all of my uh, printing right now. Um, one thing that I did run into within uh, the 24 to 48 hour uh, period is the LCD screen uh, did malfunction. Uh, only one quarter of the screen uh, displays, so I can't use the little knob to make the you know selection changes. But um, they are sending me a, a new uh, replacement screen. Uh, but what this did is it forced me to hook up the printer to OctaPrint on my Raspberry Pi. Uh, setting it up was uh, very straightforward. Uh, you All you need basically is uh, a Raspberry Pi, obviously, a uh, separate SD card to run on it. So it's um, going to be like the operating system is going to be running on a different SD card. So save your current uh, Pi uh, operating system card and uh, you know use a separate card for that. And then you'll need a uh, USB cable uh, to hook it up. I don't have a camera set up on mine, so I can't watch it uh, remotely, but one of the cool things about it is I can uh, pull it up on my phone. Uh, so if I uh, start a print and I go upstairs and I'm making a you know, cup of coffee, I can you know, pull it up on my phone and I can watch the temperature settings changing uh, or you know, what the progress is. It basically is the same thing as uh, on my computer. Um, I wouldn't want to run this thing when, you know, nobody's home. Uh, I'm sure there are people that do that. Uh, what I'd be afraid of is if there was, you know, some sort of electrical malfunction and it caught on fire. I've seen a couple pictures online of uh, the smoldering remains of uh, other people's uh, printers. So it's uh, very important from a safety standpoint to, you know, not leave it unattended unless you have, you know, some contingency, uh, you know, security type things set up so that if it did catch on fire that uh, it wouldn't burn, you know, your place down. Inherently, the process that I'm using, right or wrong, uh, and that's where, you know, I, anybody that uh, is seeing what I'm doing, uh, 
feel free to comment, but uh, I draw all of my models in SketchUp. It's a free program. Uh, it used to be Google SketchUp, but it broke off. I don't know if they're still uh, affiliated, but uh, SketchUp is uh, very easy to use. Uh, there is a PC uh, local version that you can download. It's not as easy to find, but they try to push their um, their online browser version, which it works, it's fine. Uh, but I do like having uh, a local version. Uh, that way, if you're you know offline or something, you can still you know continue to draw and save. They call me old school. Uh, after I'm done modeling it, I export it to an STL. Then I import the STL uh, as a mesh into Fusion 360. And the reason I do that is to fix the model. Um, the, sometimes you end up with some holes in it. And I'll get into that um, a little bit later. The Fusion 360 is also free uh, as long as you're not using it for commercial purposes which I'm not right now. I'm just building because I'm enjoying building. You know, it's my, my hobby. Um, I convert the mesh to a B-Rep uh, to begin fixing the model. Uh, then I save that finished file after I've done all my patching and stitching and whatnot. Um, I send that finished file uh, from Fusion 360 to Kira, which is my slicer program. And uh, I update all my Kira settings, uh, which is also a free program. Uh, it's made by Ultimaker. Uh, I slice the model. I preview it for any defects. Um, and this, I'll cover that a little bit more uh, later in the video. I save that file as a G code. And I set up my Octoprint on my PC to print the file, which Octoprint is also free. Um, Octoprint then sends the file uh, to the printer itself and I begin you know, printing. So when it comes to the modeling software, um, SketchUp and Fusion 360, I'm sure there are some modelers out there uh, that look at me and say, why on earth are you using SketchUp and not using you know through Fusion 360 for everything? Well, there's a if your background isn't in 3D modeling or if you've got limited experience with it, uh, there's a lot of learning uh, in Fusion 360, especially if you've used a different uh, modeling software. The user interface uh, was not uh, intuitive to me. Um, there's a lot of procedural stuff. Uh, it's a lot different than SketchUp or uh, AutoCAD. It, it there, when I say procedural, it's um, there's a menu that's under a certain thing and you have to click it and it's not up in the upper menu and it, it's just, it's kind of alien to me. Uh, I didn't go to school for this, so I'm learning it from scratch. Um, it's, you know, not been something that's been inherent in my professional life, so I, this is... Uh, com I'd say completely, uh, at least 90% of this is, you know, uh, learning on my own time. Uh, I like the ease of using SketchUp for the modeling. Uh, I've used it for a long time, probably over uh, 10 years-ish, um, or 8 to 10. Uh, SketchUp, though, it leaves a lot of holes in your models, and that's where you're going to run into a lot of problems. Uh, dimensions tend to be off a little bit. You'll end up with uh, something that's off by, you know, ten thousandths of an inch or millimeter, and you won't even know it because uh, you have to, like, you know, then do your dimensionals to, to you know, the arrows and stuff. Um, this will end up leading you to have to patch and stitch your model uh, in order to close up those holes, uh, and that's why I went to Fusion 360. Um, once I get it into the slicer program, uh, there's a, a preview, uh, that you can do after you slice the, per the, the model and you definitely want to do this in the beginning. I previewed it. I didn't know what I was looking at. It was like, oh, it looks fine. And I print something and I end up with, uh, you know, a bad print, uh, it, you know, may have a hole in it or a defect or some oddity. So, for example, in the picture that I'm showing on the screen, uh, I'd end up getting, like, for example, these inverted holes. Uh, so what that means is 
if I had a through hole that I was going to use to bolt um, the uh, support strut in place, uh, if I had a bad model, it would invert that and it would make the, the donut hole uh, a solid um, piece and the solid piece it would make it empty and it would invert uh, some of the other parts of the structure and it was really strange. So what I found was uh, basically that was a bad, it was a bad model. And if, if, you, if you're new to this and you skip this step, you're gonna uh, attempt to try to print something that's gonna turn out pretty bad. And when I would look online, I would read through forums and stuff and people would say, well, your model's bad. What, is it, what does that mean exactly? I, it, it didn't, that response didn't tell me uh, anything. So what, I, what I've pieced together uh, is that two or three things, maybe more, uh, contribute to this if you have overlapping shapes. Uh, so in the STL file, it turns your model into a bunch of triangles. It renders it so that it can slice it. Uh, if you have, if you were like combining different geometry, so uh, let will go back to the uh, through holes. If you design a donut, uh, that it's a through hole, you know, with uh, that you can put a bolt through, um, and then you fasten that to uh, a couple of um, you know boxes. The, it when you when the faces of those if you if you just take the donut in the box and you shove it together and you just connect it at the uh, at the interfaces and you don't delete out or you know draw any of the other interfaces in place and delete out the unneeded that becomes an extra thing that the slicer is going to have to uh, calculate for and it may not know how to handle it and um, it'll just throw all kinds of oddity weirdness into your, uh, into your finished product. Perhaps uh, someone out there can comment and uh, you know, clean up what I'm saying uh, or help me define what I'm saying. There, there might be a more technical term for it, but uh, another thing that I've uh, seen are uh, holes in your geometry. I mentioned that earlier. Uh, when you have holes in your geometry, it will create a, a mess in, in that. Sometimes you can get away with it. Most of the time you can't, uh, from my limited experience. Uh, and then hidden geometry kind of goes back with the overlapping shapes. So like I was saying, if you took you know, a bunch of donuts and a bunch of boxes and you uh, put them together and you tear them apart and then you put it back together and then you build something around it and you forget about some of the, the other pieces, your boxing and reboxing basically uh, starts to stick geometry inside of geometry and you may not see it, but the software still picks it up. So that can also throw all kinds of... Uh, variables into your drawing that you don't necessarily want. Now, as I said before, when I first started slicing, I had no idea what I was doing. I threw it in there, I looked at it, and I kind of flipped it around a couple times, said, oh, it looks fine, and started printing. And I, I'm sure that's a you know very common uh, noob um, mistake. Um, it's part of the learning process. Um, what that preview is showing you is the paths that the, um, that the extruder is going to be doing as it's following, uh, the geometry of your, your part. It'll show you, uh, any weird paths, um, that, that hidden geometry or holes in your geometry or, you know, overlapping shapes and stuff when you have to basically with a fine tooth comb or a really good eye look at the the whole of the model and, and turn it around flip it over and you know depending on how much time if you have something that's going to print in a half hour and you don't care about the material waste or the time uh if you're just you know wanting to see what the results are no problem if you're pr printing something that's going to 
take nine hours to print and it has high tolerance, dimensional tolerance, then you might want to, you know, study that a little bit longer because nothing worse than getting seven hours into your, you know, print and then finding that, ooh, I missed something and then you've got to start all over. So these are, these are things to, to consider. Um, if, and like I said, if dimensional tolerance is a big issue, especially if you're using uh, an assembly, uh, two pieces that, you know, go together, two or more pieces that go together, um, you'll want to be uh, more, you'll be wanting to study that a little bit more. If it's not an issue and you can be a little bit more liberal with it, uh, say, for example, um, like I made this uh, little challenge yourself dot blog, uh, you know, sign, shingle, whatever you want to call it. Um, I was tinkering around uh, with that so that maybe I could uh, turn that into uh, my new logo. Uh, in this case, I can be more liberal with it because I can scale it up or down and it doesn't matter because uh, it's not interfacing with anything else. So uh, these are things to, to keep in mind. Uh, one of the big issues that I ran into right from the start and I didn't understand uh, what was causing it. Uh, it was a kind of a warning sign that something was a little off, but I didn't know I had to, you know, dig into it. I was getting some oblong holes and I kind of already, uh, record this. You can see in, in, see how close I can get this without it fuzzing out too much. Um, you can see the the hole isn't exactly round, and I'm like, well, that seems weird. Maybe it's just because um, getting down to the the finer resolution, maybe it can't make that size of hole. What it turned out to be was the uh, belt on that axis was uh, not perfectly tight, or you know, not tight enough, and it would create kind of a slop uh, as it would move back and forth. Uh, once I tighten that up, uh, all of the round holes uh, went away. Now, I occasionally will get uh, some funkiness in some round objects, uh, but it's not the same issue. Um, I can get into that uh, probably in another video, but um, for the most part, that problem has completely uh, gone away. Uh, another thing that's uh, been kind of developing over time and maybe it's because the equipment's uh you know breaking in uh in the beginning i didn't have any string issues and that uh, but in here in here you can kind of see there's there's a little bit of uh the the strings um that were supposed to melt together uh didn't quite uh melt as they were supposed to that uh, I, I believe that has to do with uh, some retraction settings. I've changed some temperature, uh, extrusion settings over time. Um, it seems like I, I make it go away and then it kind of creeps back into it. And that might be part of the... Um, that might have to do kind of with the, the part itself, uh, like a combination of settings and uh, the part itself. Uh, when I started around 200 degrees, everything was fine, uh, no issues. Over time, I had to uh, start decreasing the temperature. I started seeing a lot of strings, a lot of, um, a lot of fuzz, and then when I would change it, uh, change those settings, uh, the strings would kind of go away or the fuzz would go away, but then I would you know, start to see some other issues. In the beginning, uh, the, I had some trouble with the parts not sticking to the base real well. Uh, I ended up increasing the temperature from 50 degrees to 65 degrees. And that was a, it was like a miracle. The stuff started sticking really good. Well, then it kind of went the other way. Now I'm starting to see where it's sticking too much. Uh, in fact, in the video, uh, of the robot. So this is the the latest uh, of the robot and what you can see on 
this side here, you're like, oh, you know, what's all that white stuff? That is super glue. Um, when I tried to remove this from the uh, plate and the support, uh, it was fastened so well that I damaged uh, the support because uh, it's a little weak in that joint um, flexing that way, which the arm's not going, they're not supposed to be flexing that way. It's supposed to be going this way. So most of the, the strength, you know, uh, that way is uh, in this direction is perfectly fine. Um, but uh, going side to side, it's got a little bit more give now because this is still a prototype. I, I plan on putting uh, a support beam in between these uh, it's not really designed into this because I was just I was still working out uh, some of the uh, the mechanical issues but the first one uh, turned out perfectly I can get the cable out of the way I was ec ecstatic about uh, the results of it uh, the through holes for the for the uh, bolts uh, was very good um, it was just that that second one, it ended up uh, having some issues uh, coming off that plate. So what I found with that, um, digging around online, looking at uh, some of the info that was out there, uh, people said, or one guy, um, I don't remember which form it was at, said basically if you, when it's done, let it cool down, and then turn the uh, plate heater uh, back on, uh, back up to uh, the temperature that it was at, and then try to pry it off. And that worked out really well. Uh, the same thing with um, the little uh, shingle that I made. Uh, this was stuck on the plate really, uh, really fastened on there. I just realized you can actually kind of see through it. You can't you can kind of see through it here. It's kind of funny. Anyway, um, the the outer edge of this uh, got warped a little bit as I was uh, prying it uh, from from the uh, support plate or from the heated you know bed. Uh, so that uh, I'll have to keep that in mind if I make another one at, at some point. So that's uh, in a nutshell what I've been working on. I know it's been a while since I've posted a video, um, but this has been uh, a huge uh, undertaking and I've you know, made a lot of progress. I've you know, learned a tremendous amount. It's been a blast. I've had a, a lot of fun. I've printed all kinds of stuff off of there, but these were you know, the, the main things that I've been uh, you know, producing off of this. Um, I didn't start off as a mechanical engineer, um, and I had some limited 3D modeling experience. Uh, actually I actually have a chemistry degree um, from a long time ago. Uh, so 3D modeling has, hasn't been part of my, my bag um, professionally. I've uh, managed to use it you know, a little bit here and there uh, in the professional uh, side of it, but most of it's been you know, learning at home. It's been uh, uh, quite a journey. I've I, you know, really enjoyed it. Um, it definitely exercises your mind. So um, if you've been thinking about doing this, um, definitely I recommend getting into uh, 3D printing. Take lots of notes. Make sure you keep them organized because uh, there's, there's a lot to learn uh, about this. If you're like me and you love to dive into things, um, with something already in mind. With little or zero experience in 3D printing, you're probably gonna you know, hit some of these same roadblocks that I did. Um, those 101 beginner tutorials, they don't really address some of the things because you know, you're looking at it, they're looking at it from, you wanna draw, so I'll show you how. Um, but what is kind of uh, disconnected from that is they don't know what you know and you know, they're they're not able to fill in uh, those gaps. So there's, you know, it, it's kind of an individualistic, you know, type thing. So if you're trying to do a particular thing, uh, there isn't necessarily a straightforward path uh, to do it, uh, depending on how much experience with 3D modeling you have, or if you know what slicing software is, 
uh, what resources you have, what, you know, if, do you know anybody that, you know, uh, does this, uh, for a living? I imagine that, you know, there's some people out there that, you know, have been spi inspired by someone they work with that, you know, does this, uh, that's kind of the, uh, case, a former coworker of mine, uh, has one of these, uh, at home, uh, they need to put it back together. Uh, so if they're watching this video, uh, hopefully, you know, I inspire them to, you know, get back to it. Um, but, uh, I think that's where a lot of it comes from is, you know, uh, the people around you have a positive influence on what you do. So as far as future content, uh, my intention is to kind of work this into a semi-weekly, uh, posting schedule, um, so I can primarily film, say, during the week and then edit the videos on, on the weekends and then, you know, kind of post on a predetermined schedule, um, such as, you know, posting every Wednesday and Saturday. So that way, you know, it gives you, the viewers, um, a more routine expectation of when stuff's going to be coming out. And it kind of gives me a little bit of breathing room because I've been doing a lot of this stuff on the fly where... I'll spend, you know, an entire day doing the filming and uh, also doing the editing in, in the evening. Uh, that's another thing about this journey is uh, it's surprising how much editing time there is in the videos. You can shoot a five-minute video and it can take you four hours to, you know, produce it. So it it's very, very interesting um, what goes into uh, video making content. It also makes me uh, appreciate more some of the other content uh, makers out there. I, I tend to like their videos more. I subscribe, you know, more often, and uh, you know, I comment more because I realize, you know, how much work that they're doing to to do the videos that they're uh, making. So, you know, shout out to uh, everybody that makes videos. Uh, I understand how much work goes into your uh, your work. By using the um, Raspberry Pi for the Octoprint, I basically had to yank all the wires off uh, for uh, the robot itself, and it's forcing me to go over and use the Arduino Mega, which I intended to do anyway, but uh, the timing of it uh, was kind of accelerated, so uh, I haven't had a chance to wire that up and get into the uh, into the Arduino yet, um, but I do have it, and I'll be uh, wiring up these uh, motors pretty soon. Um, what's different, uh, if you haven't seen uh, my previous videos, the Raspberry Pi can only control uh, three motors simultaneously if you were um, wiring them directly to the, the pins without using any other you know, uh, controller chips and stuff. Um, I'll be using a separate power supply. I bought, uh, I bought these little, uh, power plugs, uh, for the breadboard. I'm still in breadboarding phase. Uh, so I'll be doing, doing that, uh, soon. I got to make sure that I've got the appropriate plug. Um, so it's going to probably force me to do a little bit more wire diagramming, uh, for the, the power aspect, how much, you know, current and, uh, voltage I'm going to be uh, needing. Um, I got some new driver boards. I'm really excited uh, to use those. Um, this is one of the, the new ones. I don't recall off the top of my head what, um, what the numbers are uh, for that. The stepper motors come with their own uh, driver boards, but uh, these are supposed to uh, provide a lot more torque. Um, there's probably a few other things that I'm not going to get into in this video uh, for the sake of time, but uh, that'll um, I'll be using that more for the um, lower motors um, towards the base, since they you know are going to be the they're going to have a lot more work to do than say the upper uh, the you know wrist uh, and upper forearm part of it. Um, so that, that's, that's it in a nutshell. So if you like this video and you want to see more content like this, uh, please hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, and, you know, if anything, please share this video. Really appreciate it. So talk to you soon.